And now... The Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden, down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted, and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of... The Dance of the Devil Dogs. Hello? Anyone out here? You don't think... I don't know what to think, Chuck. We'd better take a good look around. There's something strange about this whole setup. I don't know... Emery. What? Look. It's him. Come on. No wonder he didn't answer us, Chuck. You mean... That's right. He's dead. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present... The Dance of the Devil Dolls. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled... The Dance of the Devil Dolls. Have you heard of avoutement? Literally, the word means face image. The practice of avoutement is as ancient as Egypt and Assyria, and still found from Ceylon to the United States, Europe to Africa, South America to Scandinavia. A figure is made to resemble that of a hated enemy, then methodically injured or destroyed, resulting in pain and death for its human counterpart. Charles and I had gone up for a weekend of fishing. Saturday night at dusk, when the sky had dulled from blue to gray, and the gray was shading darker every minute, we were walking back up to the cabin. Not a bad haul, huh, Emery? For you, not for me. I'll bet you the smallest of those three bass weighs over four pounds. What bait were you using? A well, spoon. The fish just wouldn't leave it alone. Anyway, we'll have a good fish dinner tonight. And maybe tomorrow my luck will change. Well, I hope so. What time is it? About nine. We've been out five hours. Chuck. Yeah? There's someone coming down the trail towards us. Where? Oh, yes, I see. You can't be going down to fish this late. Oh, well, we can't tell. Some guys really get the bug. There's a guy I know named Lloyd Erskine who will fish Excuse off... Excuse me, gentlemen. He means us. I wonder what he wants. Excuse me, gentlemen. I lost something. I wonder if you found it. <laughs> I don't know what you're looking for, mister, but we haven't found it, whatever it is. Perhaps you saw it lying on the ground. It was a doll. A doll? Yes, about 12 inches tall. It looks something like... like me. I'm sorry, we haven't seen it. Of course you can always buy your daughter... It doesn't belong to my daughter. Oh. Well, we haven't seen it. Are you staying at a cabin on this lake? Yes. Only until tomorrow night. It's right at the head of the trail up there. You must have passed it as you started down. If by any chance you do come across it, I'll stop in before I leave this area... If you don't mind. Well, that's perfectly all right. Thank you, gentlemen. I must have the doll for the dance tonight. Or the old woman will be angry. Well, what do you make of that? Search me. He talked so strangely. I must have the doll for the dance tonight, or the old woman will be angry. (laughs) I think he's off his rocker. Well, it's not our worry, Henry. Come on, let's go. We went back up to our cabin, cleaned the fish, and had one of those fish dinners you talk about for years. It was about 11 o'clock, and we'd started to go to bed, intending to get up as early as possible the next morning when there was a knock on the door. I wonder who that is. I don't know, but we'll soon find out. Oh, it's you. Yes. May I come in? Of course. I see you found the doll. Yes. I wanted to let you know that I had. Well, thanks for telling us. Now I must take him to the dance. The dance ought to be just about over. Oh, no. It it hasn't begun yet. You'd better get there or your wife will be angry. You misunderstood me. I said the old woman, not my wife. You see, I'm not married. 
Oh. I hope you'll forgive me. I see that you're just about ready to retire, but I'm afraid. Afraid? Of what? The old woman is already angry with me. I told her I'd lost the doll, and she swore that if I didn't find it, she'd kill me. That's why I've come to you. If you hear that I'm dead tomorrow, that I committed suicide, you'll know it's not the truth. If I could only get in touch with Dr. George Coltman, he could help, but I'm caught up in something I can't stop, and it's too late to get out now. I've tried to... Oh! Oh! My head! You dropped your doll. I didn't drop it. She caused it to move. She doesn't want me to talk. I've said too much already. I must go now. Here's your doll. Thank you. Remember what I told you. If I'm dead tomorrow, it's murder. Good night, gentlemen. After he dropped the doll. Did you get a good look at him, Chuck? Yeah. The doll hit the floor on its forehead. A few seconds later, there was a heavy bruise on the right side of his forehead. You know, he said if he was found dead tomorrow, that it would be murder. It was about 11.30 when we finally got to bed. We'd opened the windows of the cabin. The sound of the alarm clock we brought with us mingled with that of the crickets outside. I heard something. I didn't know what it was. It sounded strangely like words, but they were uttered in a voice so tiny and shrill that I thought I was imagining things. But then, I heard his voice. No! No, I won't die! They will help me! Henry, I didn't know you were awake. I couldn't sleep. I thought I heard a tiny little voice. I think... Be quiet! Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Dance of the Devil Dolls. Charles and I had retired for the night, but neither of us could sleep. Suddenly, from outside, we heard the voice of the man we'd met earlier, and another voice, high and shrill, and somehow deadly. There. We'd better take a look. A pair of hands and some shoes, huh? Remember what he said about dying? Yeah. You ready? Yes. All right, let's go. Beginning to think that guy belongs in an institution. Maybe. Maybe not. I think his scream came from the left. I'll take a look over there, then. He didn't tell us his name, did he? No. Well, I'll try calling him. Anybody out here? Hello? Anyone out here? You don't think... I don't know what to think, Chuck. We'd better take a good look around. Something strange about this whole setup. I don't know it. Emery. What? Look. It's him. Come on. No wonder he didn't answer us, Chuck. You mean... That's right. He's dead. That little doll that looks so much like him. I don't see it anywhere around. Neither do I. You know, Chuck, it sounds crazy to say it. That shrill, high little voice we heard. You're letting this thing run wild with your imagination, Emery. Even though it looked like him, it's just a doll, nothing else. It had to be my imagination, of that I was sure. But the mere thought of it, of the doll which so resembled the man with its shining face and beady little eyes, caused a strange sense of apprehension and fear to come across me. And I glanced out into the darkness and saw only the lumbering shadows of the trees and heard the rustle of their leaves as they brushed together. I saw nothing. Yet I had the feeling that something with beady little eyes was watching us. We notified the authorities. They came out, found no evidence of foul play, and diagnosed his death as being caused by heart failure. Our luck was exceptionally bad out on the lake Sunday, and we drove home that night, speaking but little, thinking only of what had happened the night before.
About ten days after we returned to the city, both Charles and I were home one evening. We shared an apartment together, and that night neither of us had anything to do. We were playing gin rummy. One more hand like that and you'll be out, you lucky dog. It was pure skill, my friend. No luck involved. Cut. No, I trust you. It's a good thing Pamela stood you up tonight. She knew that you wanted a gin partner. <laughs> Don't be humorous. Proposed to her yet? No, but I'm uh, working on it. You know, you deal like a card shark. I have nothing but... Expecting anyone? No, you. Mm -mm. Well, I'll see who it is. Whoever it is, get rid of him. I got a good hand. Coming right up. Is this the residence of Mr. Emery Ryerson and Mr. Charles Hunter? Yes, it is, but... I have a package for you. Are you expecting a package, Emery? Just bills, no packages. It's for both of you. All right, I'll take it. Thank you. And good evening, sir. Oh, yes, yes, good evening. It was an old woman. She had a package for us. Well, set it down on the table and open it, man. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. So I'll open it. Oh, it's wrapped very well. Maybe it's a bottle of scotch. Who is be sending us a bottle of... Someone has a real fine sense of humor. It's like the doll that fellow had with him. It's the same doll. Notice that little nick out of its forehead? That happened when he dropped it on the floor. What are we going to do with it? I don't know. We can keep it, I suppose. Well, let's get back to the game. No, I'm not in the mood now. You know, Emery, I can't help but remember what he said. The man who died? Yes. He said, I must have the doll for the dance tonight. Or the old woman will be angry. Yes, that's right. What brought that back to your mind? The woman who delivered this package. We put the lid back on the box and left it on the kitchen table with the cards we'd been using. Neither of us entered the kitchen again that evening. We went to bed a short time after 12. Again, I was restless and couldn't sleep. I had the same feeling I'd had that night in the cabin. And I remembered the words I'd heard spoken in that unearthly little voice. The old woman will take care of them, too. And I wondered if I'd only imagined those words, or whether they had actually been uttered by the creature in the box in the other room. Then I heard it like a thin, reedy piping. It sounded like music, a rhythmic, discordant melody I'd never heard before. And then I heard another sound. Henry? Yes? Am I going crazy? I hear it, too. I think we'd better see what it is. All right. I don't like this, Henry. It sounds I like... I know what it sounds like. Emery. I can't believe my eyes. The box is open. And the little doll, Emery. It's moving. It's dancing on the table. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Dance of the Devil Dolls. Charles and I couldn't believe our eyes, for the scene before us was as bizarre and fantastic as the wildest dream of an insane imagination. It's moving. It's dancing on the table. Yes, I see it. This is something that... I'm going to destroy that thing. Be careful. Look out, Chuck. It's running. I'm going to get it if it's the last thing I do. It's running over toward the window. It's gone. It's gone through the glass. Maybe it's down there on the sidewalk. It's possible, but that's a two-story drop. I can't see it. No, Emery. It's gone. He turned again to the old woman. The man who had died had mentioned a name that night in the cabin. The name of Dr. George Kaltman. Now it came back into my mind. Kaltman was associated with occult research. If Kaltman could have helped the man who died, perhaps he could explain what was happening to us. We got in touch with him and made an appointment for the following evening. 
You have told me everything that has happened. Is that correct, gentlemen? Yes, everything. We'd like to know what it all means. Well, I shall explain it to you as best I can. Have either of you ever heard of envoûtement? No. Not that I recall. Well, envoûtement is the practice of making little dolls to resemble a hated enemy and then methodically injuring or destroying it, thus bringing about either pain or death or both in the doll's human counterpart. Dr. Colton, this doll we saw last night, it, it moved, it danced. I know. What you witnessed last night was the dance of the devil dolls. You say these dolls bring about pain or death, Dr. Kaltman. Why should we be singled out? The man who died told you about the old woman. Is that not correct? Yes. Therefore, you must be destroyed. She feels that you are dangerous to her, that you know too much. Undoubtedly, the woman you saw last night, Mr. Hunter, was the manipulator, controller of the little figures. Since you saw her, she has probably made little figures of both of you. But before it will live and be subject to her will, she must have a part of you, a lock of your hair, a fingernail clipping, anything that will make yours and the doll's identity one and the same. What should we do? Go back to your apartment. I shall return with you. She will send the little doll back to your apartment tonight. I'm sure of that. We must capture the doll, for it is the only thing that will lead us to her. Kaltman, Charles, and I returned to our apartment and took up our vigil in the bedroom, for that was the place the doll and the old woman would expect us to be. We made dummies of the extra blankets and arranged the bed so it looked as if we were sleeping. You left the apartment door unlocked? Yes. But why? It only makes it easier for it to enter. See, it is what we must do. One way or the other, the doll would find means of entrance. If not tonight, then another. You have no idea what those little creatures are capable. Listen. It is coming. Be quiet. Wait until it is in here. Then close the bedroom door and put on the lights. We understand. Now, quiet. There it is, over there. This time it won't get away. Don't let it get near the window. I've got it, I've got it. Quickly, put it in here. Ah, there. We have it. Now, ah, what do we do? The star will lead us to the star woman. You mean now? Tonight? Yes, Mr. Ryerson. She will know that we have captured her little messenger if it does not return in a few hours, and she will be prepared to stop us. We must find her, destroy her if need be, before she has a chance to destroy you. Then began one of the strangest sights I've ever seen. Coltman took the doll out of the box in which we'd imprisoned it, tied its arms and legs while it writhed and twisted in his hand. Then he began speaking to it, my softly, rhythmically. Slowly putting it into a hypnotized sleep. The eyelids of the little figure finally closed. And it was in an hypnotic trance. Sleep and tell me. Now, listen to me. You must tell me where your mistress is. You must tell me where your mistress is. The house. The house of dolls. The house of dolls. It's a strange answer. Not so strange, my friends. I know what it means. What is it? She is a diabolical person, this doll woman. The house of dolls is a toy shop with rare and unusual dolls. What better place to hide? No one would suspect what was behind those burning eyes of hers. I myself have purchased dolls for my little granddaughter from her. We must go there immediately. We have no time to lose. This is the place. Let's go. Right. It's past two. There's no one on the streets. Oh, it's a better. Try the door. It's open. Probably waiting in the rear of the shop. 
was a creature she sent out. Well, let's go in. As quietly as possible. We must catch her by surprise. All right. There's a light coming from beneath that door back there. That is where we must go. Listen. It is the dance of the devil dies. The door is ajar. They're in there. I can see them. Yes, so do I. Be quiet. And soon, my children, you will be joined by two others. <laughs> and then, no one can harm you. But when the new doll returns, he will bring with him what I need for the spell of the dancers. We must take her now. And they will join you in the, the dance of, of the devil doll. Now! What are you doing here? We've come to stop you. Look out, Bob, she has a gun. So have I. <laughs> She is dead. She will cause no more harm. It seems strange to see those little creatures on the floor. All of them so quiet and still. And just a short while ago. They were participating in the dance of the devil dolls. Yes. Do not feel pity for them, Mr. Hunter. The dolls did not really live. They were a creation of evil, sparked by the malevolence of the old woman. When she died, they died with her. Perhaps the humans they resembled will rest quietly now. Tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental.